Uh, first patient is 23 year old male uh, who suffered this uh, bite wound from his father on his right small finger with a uh, P2 fracture. There was lacerations radially and ulnarly. Um, he was given unison in the emergency department and then sent home on augmentin and then he was put into a static splint. We also had a bedside IND. Uh, next patient is a 37 year old female who accidentally caught her right to small finger on the truck door with his distal phalanx partial amputation. She received an IND. Uh, there was a little bit of bone that was ronchered down uh, and then she had good soft tissue coverage with 5 monocryl. Her extensor and flexor tendons were intact. It's a 14 year old male uh, who suffered a fall down the stairs about five days prior to me seeing him. Um, he was seen at an urgent care and then sent into the office. And then he came from the office back into uh, the emergency department for a closed reduction. Um, he suffered this fourth and fifth metacarpal neck fracture. He was closed, reduced, um, placed into an ulnar gutter splint. This is a 26 year old male um, who had an altercation where he took a baseball bat to his left lower leg and suffered this left Weber B um, C ankle fracture. He was neurovascularly intact. He was intact. He was stress uh, negative on x-ray. Um, and he was closed, reduced, and put into, or sorry, just put into a short AO splint. Um, and then he ended up leaving AMA and walking out on his own. Uh, next patient is a 21-year-old male uh, who suffered this uh, Luxatio erecta during weightlifting, he was doing a dumbbell um, shoulder press. Um, the, weight, the weight went backwards and he felt a pop. Um, he came in in, a, in abduction about 90 degrees and was unable to move the shoulder. Uh, he was closed, reduced, and placed into a sling. Neurologically intact? Neurologically, neuro, neurologically intact, um, pre-reduction and post-reduction. How do you want to manage Luxatio that? Luxatio erecti? Um, I believe it said that I think with neurologic injury, these are about 60% and vascular is about 40%. And then uh, long term, um, you can get a maxillary thrombosis um, down the reasons. How do you think that 14 year old was going to do with the, uh, the metacarpal fracture? One, one second, I like the volume. How do you think that 14 year old is going to do with the metacarpal fracture? Um, I think they're going to do okay. The reduction looks a lot better um, and within the acceptable limits. Um, I think he should do fine. I've never seen somebody with, with this heel where they were really unhappy, even if there was a lot of flexion at the site. I know we quote 50 degrees as acceptable limit, but um, I think these patients tend to be, tend to do all right as long as there's a malrotation. Which you just have to worry about with consecutive fractures. Good morning. Uh, first patient is a 34 year old male who fall and sustained a right ankle bimalleolar fracture dislocation. He was initially closed reduced and placed in a short AO splint. He was taken for an ankle ORIF. Next patient is a 39 year old female status post fall with a left ankle bimal equivalent fracture dislocation. Initially closed reduced, placed in a short AO splint, taken for ankle ORIF. Next patient is a 60 year old male status post fall with a left subtrochanteric fracture with intertrochanteric extension. While neck was intact, was taken for a uh, left hip intramedullary nail.
Next patient is a 79 year old female who had a fall and had a left hip subtrochanteric fracture with a reverse obliquity pattern. She's taken for a hip intramedullary nail. Jason, what's the classic pattern of deformation with a subtroch? I'm sorry? What, what's the classic deformation pattern? Uh, you know, what, what, what pattern does that, the uh, proximal fragment go into? Yeah, the proximal fragment would be uh, flexed, abducted, and externally rotated. What about the distal fragment? What's pulling on that? Uh, the distal fragment would be adducted and extended. Uh, last patient is a 12 year old male who had a fall while playing soccer, stained a right thumb P1 base fracture. He was closed reduced and placed in a thumb spike. Any reason you guys chose to go short for the, the second subtroke? Sorry, one second. Can you repeat that? Any reason you guys chose to go short for the second subtroke? Uh, I don't think there was a particular reason. I think the fracture pattern just didn't extend uh, so far where the short nail would be sufficient. Um, but I believe the literature shows that short nails and long nails are uh, similar in terms of functional outcome and secondary complications. So it was just uh, a timing preference. Yeah, um, so, I mean, I agree. I mean, you could definitely, you might not necessarily call that a subtroke. Um, the fracture line does go pretty distal, but it doesn't have that same deformation pattern as the, the first one you showed, so. The first one definitely needs a long nail. That literature that you mentioned, there being no difference between short short nails and long nails. What's the uh, what's the important, uh, I guess, the characteristic of those fractures? What do they have to be for there to be no difference? You're are you. You're talking about the fracture pattern, like what the fracture pattern has to be? Right, exactly. Yeah. So what frac like what in yeah, order for there to be no difference between long and short nails, does it have to be stable, unstable? Yeah. Uh stable uh intertroke fractures was referencing. So what is a stable intertroke? Uh so like unstable patterns would be like a reverse obliquity, um, like inner uh intertroke to substroke extension. Um shortened uh, medial hinge or uh, a comminution of the lateral wall. Morning. First case, a uh, three-year-old male status post fall from a trampoline with a right proximal tibia fracture. It's closed injury, neurovascular intact, placed into a long leg cast in extension, the little varus mold. This is a 16-month-old. Uh, I don't think your images are <clears throat> coming through. Sorry about that. That was the first case. Second case, 16-year-old, uh, 16-month-old uh, 16 male, stats post fall with a left distal tibia fracture, closed, nervously intact, and placed into a long leg cast. I felt. This is a 35-year-old male, status post fight playing hockey um, with a right closed fourth metacarpal transverse shaft fracture, who's nervously intact with no rotational deformity. 
uh, given the transverse nature of the fracture, he was taken for a closed reduction and pretty instantaneous pinning. This is an 80 year old, four year old female status post fall with a right olecranon fracture, closed neurovascular intact. She was taken for a olecranon or IF with a tension band construct. This is a was it 60. Open? It was not open. What's the literature, best literature that we have say about these fractures? So there's current literature that says in elderly low demand patients that non-operative management is similarly functional outcomes to operative management. Um, she is 84. Except, um, except except what functional outcomes are the same what's not the same motion a lot of complications with surgery oh uh, gotcha so yeah that, that's the removal. difference not hardware removal wound complications failure need for revisions hardware removal although sometimes planned is still a complication it's a second surgery for an 84 year old patient so hardware removal the, is not a complication. It, 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 a second surgery procedure is not a considered complication. Does a hip replacement, if we do a second surgery on it, consider it's technically a, we plan some of them, but they're, they're still a second surgery. Yeah, second surgery does not equal complication though. <laughs> if you say, listen, you're gonna, we're gonna get this hardware in there and someday we may need to take it out and it bothers them, because that's of, not a, that is not a complication. Painful hardware, if anything else is, would technically, you plan it because you know it's gonna happen, but there are, in this case, for example, if, if you, you put the hardware it, on sideways and it's sticking out through the skin, you could probably consider that a complication if you put it in wrong. But, you know, that's an understood part of, you know, putting some, some parts of hardware in, some locations that are subcutaneous, that's not complication. So when you do, for example, electronons, plate versus K-wires, K-wires have a higher rate of removal of, for, of the hardware. So there's alternatives that will decrease your need for secondary surgery, correct? So then the paint, the no, it's a subcutaneous of area. You could you could put a button in there. You could put a single screw in there and still have to take it out. I don't want you. This is actually not worth arguing about. Let's move on. Hey, Jeremy, well, I, I just have a quick question for you on that one. What what nerve are you worried about there, and and why? Yeah, so um, you're worried about the uh, AIN, um, which comes out like a centimeter and a half distal to the coronoid there. Um, so you worry a little bit about the, the K-wires penetrating the anterior cortex there. I think they're a little past that, so we should be okay. This is a 63-year-old uh, female status plus fall with a closed left minimally displaced medial malfracture in a fifth metatarsal shaft fracture. She was made non-weight bearing in a short AO splint. Good morning. First, we have a right-hand dominant 15-year-old female, stats with scramble and fall. She sustained a left shoulder dislocation. She's a recurrent dislocator. She had actually dislocated uh, the day prior uh, and was closed reduced at an, at an outside facility. She's closed reduced here today. Uh, in this case, she'll follow up. She's getting a slow. You have to sedate her? Yeah, the first time also required a sedation. Wait, how many times has she dislocated, do you know? Uh, so she had a dislocation event, uh, at least one, she said about three or four years prior to this, uh, and then two in that uh, kind of 48 hour period. Is she and, looking and, to lax? Uh, you know, I checked, I, I calculated the Bain score. She only had two, so no, not, not particularly, but. So then what do you think you should do next for this girl? Uh, so I think she needs some advanced imaging, uh, evaluate the, uh, the, the competency of the, the glenoid. Um, and she probably may, you know, yeah. 
that next step. What do you expect to see on your advanced imaging? Uh, for her, um, she probably has uh, bad cards, uh, whether it's bony or, or soft tissue. Uh, we'll see. And then from there, uh, we'll see if it's you know something that we would do any sort of procedure for, if it's just a bank heart repair, or if she's lost a lot of the glenoid, which it doesn't look like she has, uh, then she may need um, some bony work. Next. Do you think there's a psychiatric component to this at all? No, no, I don't think so. She didn't give that sense. Next is a one-year-old female. Is that supposed to fall from couch? She has left both bone forearm fracture. Uh, she was placed into a splint, uh, without, uh, pardon me, a cast reduction. Next is a right hand dominant nine year old male. So that's what's ground will fall. It's right distal radius uh, fracture. It's placed into a sure tongue splint. Next is a 13 year old male, right hand dominant, punched uh, the table at school. He has this right fifth metacarpal neck fracture. It was reduced, placed into a ulnar gutter splint. Adults, next we have a 70 year old male, so that's what's MVC, he has his left uh, C5 facet, uh, C4 spinous process fracture. Uh, his patient was near vascularly intact. Uh, MRI showed no involvement of the cord or posterior elements. He's treated conservatively with hard cervical orthosis. Next is a 92 year old female, so that's what's ground will fall uh, with this uh, T12 three column injury. Uh, notably, she had an injury. It's very rare in the past. It's acute on chronic. Uh, she's also neurovascularly intact and um, we're going to be treated with uh, TLS overrising. Next is a 40 year old male who tripped over his dog uh, and sustained this left and a new ankle fracture, proximal tibia with some subtle uh, widening on the stress view. I just made a non way bearing short, a uh, long, a uh, short AO part. Joe Bar, you got to speak up. Gotcha. Uh, 40 year old male, he tripped over his dog. He had this left Mason Uve ankle fracture. He had sudden, subtle opening, widening on uh, stress view. Uh, he was given a short AO splint. Uh, his patient elected to follow up as an outpatient for, uh, for surgical, possible surgical planning. Next is a 29 year old male who jumped uh, down six stairs and landed on a, a rock. Uh, he has this uh, right list frank uh, dis injury uh, dislocation. Uh, this patient was scheduled to go to surgery. Um, uh, and after I splinted, he left against medical advice. Next, we have, uh, why did he leave? He just didn't, just didn't want to stay. I, I'm actually not sure. We just got a, yeah, he loved. We got a call from the ED that he just, he wasn't there anymore. Yeah. So, uh, Next is a right-hand dominant 41-year-old female. Uh, she was dancing uh, with her daughter and uh, fell onto her right arm. Right distal radius fracture, just clothes reduced, placed into a sugar tongue splint. And finally, we have this 37-year-old male. Uh, right uh, Joe, Mar yep. Joe Mar, excuse me. What are you going to do with that one, the 41-year-old? Uh, I think, you know, close, close monitoring, but I, I think... Uh, she can probably be non-operative if she stays just as she is. Yeah, what are the, what's the chance of that staying? Uh, well, you know, she only has, she's young. She doesn't have an older style. Uh, there is, I think it may go up into the, the, the joint. Um, and uh, she was angulated dorsally a lot. So two out of five of the cord gravity factor factors, the stability factors. I think she has a good chance of staying up here. Is there any recent literature about how these fractures do treated operatively versus non-operatively? Uh, I imagine there's, but, you know, uh, the most recent thing that I've read was that, you know, people just recommend treating uh, them operatively, any of these kind of displaced extra-articular fractures operatively, because um, they, they tend to do better. But uh, I, I don't know. I think there's a role for non-operative treatment in this case. So, you know, that article basically argues that, you know, looking at a, you know, quality adjusted life years that patients will get back to work better or faster and recover quicker, even if, if you fix them 
acutely, even if they're they're reduced acceptably. Like this is a great reduction, but um, you know, I, but that again, that that paper is from Europe, so the cost could be different here. But you know, surgery is yeah. not, you know, out of the picture for this patient, especially if it displaces and follow up. Exactly, and 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 explain to her, so she'll be she'll be seeing us. So we we could end the crisis of people not working by fixing all their wrist fractures. That was supposed to be funny. I think that's part of the Build Back Better initiative. Oh, okay. Higher reimbursements for two five six oh nine. Wait, wait, this right again. Got it. All righty, uh, and finally, we have a right, dominant thirty seven year old male who was a uh, stainless distal radius fracture two weeks ago. He this was his initial splinting. He was casted in this position. Uh, he. Um, fell into a pool, got his cast wet. I recasted him um, in a little bit less flexion. Uh, he'll follow up with his, his uh, primary orthopedic surgeon. Uh, next, we have this right-hand dominant 20-year-old male. Uh, he had a saw, cut his hand at home, uh, his left index finger, fingertip amp. Um, that piece of bone was uh, covered uh, after I washed it. Uh, there were no large debris, so will let him heal by secondary intention. He's placing a soft dressing. Next, we have this left-hand dominant 24-year-old male, so that's MVC of this right uh, third metacarpal shaft fracture. Uh, he obviously has this congenital hand deformity. Uh, this is what his hand looked like uh, grossly. And he was placed into AP slabs and we'll see him in the office as well. Next is a right-hand dominant 30-year-old male. Stasbos uh, slamming his hand in the door. His car with this right fourth metacarpal shaft fracture. He's placed into AP slabs. No non repairing follow up as well. Body traumas. We have a right-hand dominant 60-year-old male. Stasbos fall from the uh, back of a truck about six feet. Uh, he has this left LC1 pelvis fracture. Uh, he also has a left uh, radial head fracture. For his radial head fracture, uh, this patient had um, no block to motion. He was about 140 degrees pronosupination, uh, and he had uh, minimal pain and good flexion and extension. So we'll treat well non-operative treatment for this patient. Gilmore, let's just go back to that radial head. Yeah. Do, do you think there's a displaced fragment there? Yeah, you know, I think it looks like uh, it, it, it's got impacted down uh, and the posterior part has displaced, uh, yes. You know, I, when I look at this, when you look at that olecranon at the very proximal ulna, it almost looks like there's a double or an increased density there. And as you look on the AP, you see something at the lateral aspect of the uh, joint. So it, I think this is gonna be markedly displaced radial head fracture. It looks comminuted to me. So this looks it like is. one you might want to get additional imaging on. Sure. We'll consider. We'll consider. Let's say it's terribly comminuted and there's excellent motion. What what do you do? I mean, if he has if he has excellent motion, uh, no blocks of motion. Uh, I think there was a, um, a study that looked at the long term outcomes uh, for these these um, these fractures in the, in the radial head. And they said that, you know, ORIF versus uh, non-operative treatment, there was no appreciable uh, benefit to, to ORIF, um, even in patients who had to, who were treated non-operatively, who ultimately went on to radial head excision, as long as they didn't have um, DRUJ instability, they all did, they did well uh, or comparably in terms of range of motion and pain in the long run. So in a high energy common radial head fracture, what part of the exam were you missing for this, for the extremity? Yeah, so you know this patient wasn't painful in the in the wrist or when when I examined him. So uh, you know I should I should have just gotten the, the wrist film. Yeah, you absolutely need to document the wrist, and you should also palpate the forearm just to make sure there's no tenderness at the sites of, you know, origin and insertion of the the central band and the uh, and the distal oblique band. You know, but but you can even it's it's hard to appreciate longitudinal instability early on. This is something that you know anybody can miss. So you got to keep a close eye on these patients and, and follow them with sequential radiographs until it heals. But I agree. I mean, you know, th there's no, if there's no block to motion, we've never shown that these fractures do any better treated operatively versus non-operatively and going to be tough to fix this fracture and get solid fixation. So, um, you know, I, 
arthroplasty is never a great option and it's somebody who's not you know that old so if you want to see that radial head any better another any other imaging you would get you probably get a, a green scan view uh, you could also get a ct scan yeah, so tell the audience what a green span view is. That's just a, uh, like an internal bleak of the, the radial of the elbow. Because the x-ray techs don't know all the eponyms, so you need to, need to know what else you might call it. A radio capitellar view. Check the also call it a trauma shot. It is helpful in the office sometimes. Thanks. And then uh, another pile, we have an 84 year old female, Sestus MVC. She sustains left C2 and C3 transverse for Raymond fracture, uh, left greater trochanter fracture, hip, and then a uh, right scapula fracture. Uh, she was neurovascular intact uh, on the on arrival. Uh, she, we evaluated with this uh, rear trunk fracture with an MRI, which is not included here, which did not show extension to the femoral neck and it's her scapula. Uh, we were going to treat her, the, the plan was to treat her non-operatively. She had a small subdural, unfortunately that progressed and this patient has since passed away. Thanks. morning. First patient is a five-year-old male presenting after a fall. This left non-displaced supraventular humerus fracture. Patient was uh, neurovascularly intact, placed in a posterior splint. Next patient is a nine-year-old male, uh, got hit with a soccer ball, um, and had this left uh, thumb metacarpal phalangeal joint dislocation. Patient was uh, closed reduced and uh, was uh, stable after reduction, uh, placing the splint. Next patient is a 84 year old female presenting after a ground level fall, the left hip intertrochanteric fracture. She was medically optimized and taken to the operating room for a hip intramedullary nail. Next patient, is an 85 year old female uh, after a ground level fall, with this right non displaced tibial plateau fracture. Uh, X rays were initially read as negative. Primary team obtained. A CAT scan due to continued pain. And uh, she was found to have this uh, not displaced uh, lateral tibial plateau fracture. She was uh, placed in a hinge knee brace, early in range of motion. Next patient is a 18 year old male, fell off one of the scooters, electric scooters, uh, presented with this right tibial plateau fracture. CT was obtained to further characterize the fracture pattern. Patient was taken to the operating room for an open reduction internal fixation. What would you call this? Did you fracture? So, so, sorry, I had two questions. Shats, well, well, what's Shats care classification oh, is this, and um, what is it? Describe it a little more. It's not just on your CT. It's probably a little more than just the plateau fracture. Uh, yes, yeah, so this would be a Shats care four, um, you know, just like a. There was a medial um, fragment. There was also like this posterior, uh, posterior medial fragment as well. And uh, there was a fragment uh, centrally as well that we had to elevate. What do you, th what do you think is going on in the middle of the uh, knee right now with those little fragments inside the joint? Um, I mean, it's probably where the ACL attaches. He, he was uh, lax preoperatively and then we, you know, Postoperatively, we examined him as well, and he was still lax, so he is going to need you know, further imaging for uh, ligamentous injury evaluation. So, so medial plateau fractures, what are they all essentially a sign of in some, some cases? Um, they, they can be a sign of a knee dislocation. Um, since there's no like medial That's... buttress, you can have the, uh, the lateral aspect of the tibia kind of go out laterally, and you can have some neurovascular injury as a result. Yeah, well, and that this is probably a good example of that. It, it, it didn't, the bone just didn't break. There's also disruption of the ACL or PCL, whatever it is. So in an 18-year-old, you'd want to watch this closely. Right. 
next patient is this 56 uh, year old male um, who presented with uh, lower back pain, uh, found to have this L1 pathologic uh, fracture. MRI was obtained and uh, workup revealed a diagnosis of likely uh, myeloma. Patient was uh, medically optimized and taken to the operating room. For uh, T11 to L2 laminectomy, T10 to L3 posterior spinal fusion. Was she neuro intact or she had a neurologic deficit? Yes, so surprisingly, the patient was neurologically intact. It was mostly pain that the patient was complaining about. Um, I, I, I think uh, you know, the patient had about six weeks or so of pain and uh, had come to the emergency department initially. Um, and at that time, every, you know, all the workup was negative. And then they presented again due to continued pain and worsening of the pain and uh, was found to have this fracture. But um, you know, uh, there, was, there was no neurologic deficit on exam. This is an isolated multiple myeloma lesion? Um, so we did uh, obtain bone scans, and uh, there were some lesions in the femur, but uh, we obtained MRIs as well. The patient was painless, um, and not, not, not reporting any, any symptoms from those. So uh, there, there was no indication for uh, prophylactic uh, kneeling or anything of the femurs at this time. Are, are these lesions amenable to any type of radio or chemotherapy? Yeah, so myeloma is very responsive to radiation therapy. So the plan is, um, you know, after this fixation, the, the patient would obtain radiation therapy, and those are usually pretty successful. Do you have to even stabilize these? Like why, can't, um, why can't you just radiate them? Why can't you just treat them medically? Well, I mean, if looking at the, the L1 vertebral body, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, there's significant impaction, and it just wouldn't be a stable, uh, especially after the radiation, if there's, you know, any um, tumor or anything that's in there that, you know, eventually dissipates, it would form an even less stable uh, spine at that, especially at that level. So I think you need fixation prior to radiation to prevent any further uh, collapse. What if that was osteoporosis? What if you just had a, I'm, I'm at, maybe I'm missed, go back to the injury film, whatever your presentation film. Just osteoporosis. Um, the old lady comes in with a L1 compression fracture that looks like that. Yeah. What do you yeah, do? I mean, I think if the posterior elements are intact, um, you know, you have the option of treating that with, without surgery. Posterior elements intact? It, it did look intact, yeah. But I think give, given his disease, you know, we kind of had to. Right, but we see, we see multiple myeloma all the time affecting multiple levels, uh, and we don't operate on all of that. Like, isn't there an indication? What's the indication? Just if you have disease, you have to operate on it? None of this will respond and and be stable after response. This is a very responsive tumor. I mean, I think, you know, given the risk that it can progress and, you know, given his significant uh, pain that he was experiencing and radiculopathy, I think, you know, the, the choice you, to at you least just, go in. You just said the patient was neuro intact. Yeah, the patient was neuro intact, but, but reporting significant pain. Well, that's what back they pain have pain with multiple myeloma. Um, yeah, it was back pain and radicular pain. So then how did you address the radicular pain? Well, you know, through the laminectomy, we should have decompressed. Oh, did they do a laminectomy? Yeah, we, we did a laminectomy as well. Thank you. Uh, Dan. Dan. Hello. Hey, Dan. Hey, how's Just it going? Real, real quick, what, so what was that, 50 whatever year old with pathologic lesion? Yes. What's your differential? Um, so, I mean, it, it, like Dr. Guy mentioned, it could be osteoporosis, could be myeloma. It could be metastasis from another uh, primary tumor as well. What? Uh, so what primary? So, um, you know, given that he's, you know, 56 year old male, uh, prostate cancer is always on the differential. Um, you know, we also worry about, you know, colon cancer and um, other solid tumors. No. 
No, come I'm on. You guys got to know that you just had your, your in training. Um, yeah. Also, four. Uh, renal, renal cell can also uh, metastasize as well, as well as um, uh, lung cancer. Dan, do you know the, uh, the acronym BLT in a kosher pickle? Uh, I know lead kettle. That's... Okay, just whatever it is. Just you want to have uh, you want to have an acronym for the primary tumors that most likely go to bone, and then also the ones that tend to go to the spine. Very like Dr. Swan just said, it's a it's a good move uh, for test taking. What's lead kettle? Uh, yeah, PB. Uh, so uh, prostate, breast, uh, kidney, um, lung, and uh, thyroid. Okay, I like that. And then, like we know, you throw in myeloma and you throw in lymphoma as well can can be seen in the elderly or anyone. <clears throat> Thank you. In terms of a myeloma case, um, you know, radiation and stuff is fine, but they don't get immediate relief. And, you know, this guy had pretty severe radicular pain. Um, he was fairly immobile. So that was a major indication for surgery. Um, he was had strength on testing, but, um, you know, even, even if you radiate those, you're not going to see that buckling of the posterior cortex causing severe cord compression at the conus improve uh, anytime soon. So that was a major indication for the surgery. Good morning. Uh, first patient is a five-year-old male, uh, fell down some stairs. He has this right uh, distal both bone uh, fracture. Uh, he was closed, reduced, uh, placed into a sugar tongue splint. Next patient here is a 56-year-old female, uh, status post um, ground level fall uh, with a right distal radius fracture. She was closed, reduced, and placed into a sugar tongue splint. morning. First patient, a 12-year-old female who fell off her brother's shoulders onto the left arm, staying the left elbow dislocation, was closed, reduced, and placed into a posterior splint. This is a 53-year-old male, so I suppose a motorcycle collision, the right middle third clavicle fracture, uh, skin was intact, neurovascular intact, he was placed into a sling. Is a 59-year-old male, status post, fall off a scooter with a right small finger, uh, proximal phalanx, base, and metacarpal base fracture, both non-displaced. He was placed into ulnar gutter splint. This is a 48-year-old male who injured his left uh, long finger tuft with a table saw. Uh, his wound was irrigated and debrided, and he was placed into a soft dressing. Can you go back a, to that, that proximal phalanx fracture? Yeah. What position did you immobilize that in? Uh, well, I was aiming for intrinsic plus, but he was very stiff. Okay, because just as a, a reminder, even though they are non-displaced initially or minimally displaced, if you put them in a splint with the MP joint straight, and they show up a week later, don't be surprised if they're angulated apex volar. Gotcha. Yeah, I try, this is actually like as far down as you would let me flex him. He's very swollen and stiff there. Okay. Uh, this is a 54-year-old female who slipped on a wet floor, sustained a left stress-negative uh, Weber B ankle fracture. She was placed in a posterior splint for comfort. Is a 55 year old female who fell on the stairs and had a right ankle fracture, uh, also stress negative Weber B, who also had a left uh, ankle sprain. So she was given bilateral air casts so that she could still get around. 
uh, just to go to go back on that splint again. Um, I think we've talked about it before, but I think just putting the um, plaster or fiberglass on the dorsum allows you to bend it more. Otherwise, there's just too much material on the bowler side. And and the other worry here, not even about displacement, but is about MP contracture because she's going to be swollen from two fractures. And if she's in extension and not bending it now, it might be tough to get later. So, and I've never done this, but if she's really that stiff, I wonder if, you know, you can anesthetize the joint to allow you to get a better intrinsic plus position when she leaves. Yeah, I did consider doing a, like a metacarpal block, um, but he, it really wasn't pain limited. It was just, he has really big, like immobile hands, but I think that that's a good idea to just block him on the dorsal side so that he can still flex down. So a 15 year old male who was trying to dunk, uh, go on a stretch hand as a left distal radius fracture, extra seal. It's close to reduce and put in a sugar tongue splint. Next is a 30 year old speak male. up, please? Sure. Uh, next is a 30 year old male with, uh, uh, was fell from 10 stairs as a bilateral posterior C1 arch, uh, teardrop C2 extending in transverse foramen. Uh, T3 burst with T1 to 3 spinous process and T1 to 5 transverse process fractures. Uh, he is being managed uh, non operatively in a uh, CTO. Uh, CTA was obtained. He's completely neurovascularly intact. CTA was negative. Uh, MRI was obtained as well, which uh, essentially shows the uh, same injuries. What are you worried about with that CTA? Why are you getting it? Uh, since it extended into the transverse foramen, we worried about a uh, vertebral artery injury. What's the biggest thing you worried about with this person's injury? I think potential for um, neurologic uh, compromise. Well, he's neurointact now, but what are, what's the closest thing you're going to follow with this patient, particularly for the thoracic fracture? I mean, if there's any retroposin uh, of the T3 falls into kyphosis. Right. So this is at the upper thoracic, you know, at, where there's a, a kyphotic alignment already. And it's, it's very difficult to mobilize with a CTO, but luckily he seems to be on the thinner side. So you have to follow this very closely because he has spinous process fractures at T1, 2, and 3 as well. And although this is mostly a bony injury, um, you know, this thing can fall into kyphosis quickly. And if he heals that way, um, you know, it can really affect his posture and uh, his alignment. Um, so he needs to be followed closely with, you know, x-rays every, at least every week, um, and possibly a CT scan within, within the first one to two weeks as well. And he's got to be very compliant with his brace. It's a 26 year old male with the inferior border of the scapula fracture is treated non operatively in a sling. 36. What's the mechanism on that? Mechanism, he was uh, thrown from a motor, motor scooter and landed directly under the shoulder on the curb, I believe. 36-year-old uh, female got her left uh, small finger caught in a conveyor belt at work. And she had a very small partial amp nail bed injury on the left small finger. She was uh, irrigated and uh, bone was covered with soft tissue. Uh, it's a 22-year-old male who's dancing in his front yard, has a uh, left Sagan fracture and associated ACL injury. He was putting an immobilizer, weight bearings tolerated. Next is a 15-year-old male who's a right radial shaft Hold fracture uh, while playing, sustained while playing football, initially closed reduced. He was taken a few days later for RIF radial shaft. Uh, next is a 14-year-old male who got his left uh, thumb caught uh, while playing basketball, I believe, as a base of the thumb metacarpal uh, fracture, uh, he was taken for uh, close reduction of percutaneous pain.
What type of Salter injury was that? Salter's two fractures. Was there Did the ER call you because of the gun fracture? Just out of curiosity. Is that why you got called? Okay. On that ACL tear, is the ER yeah. called you because of the gun? But you didn't let them. Thank you. Was there uh, any, you reduced the thumb in the ER? You reduced the thumb in the ER. The thumb was reduced in the ER, yes. Well, how'd you put the K wires in? That was done in the OR. You reduced it in the ER and you pinned it in the OR? Yes. Is there a reason it why? Did, it, apparently, it did not maintain reduction. I'm sorry, I'm just repeating what he's saying. In the office, it didn't maintain reduction, so it was brought to the OR for a percutaneous pinning. Good morning. Uh, first patient is a two year old female, stats was fall off the couch, present with this left type two supraconolar humerus fracture. She was neurovascularly intact. She was taken the following morning for a left elbow plus reduction to percutaneous pinning. Not, not to harp on the same thing, but were those x-rays taken from the office or the ER? On the elbow? On the thumb. It, it, were the uh, x-rays taken in the office or in the ER? I mean, the, the reason I'm asking is what's the indication for fixing a thumb proximal phalanx fracture? That's extra articular. What, what can you accept is another way of asking the question. Except I think for an extra articular fracture of the thumb, uh, three millimeters, I believe, of displacement. 30 degrees of angulation. Three. Well, the point, you, you can accept a lot of, you can accept a lot of deformity that does very well, but it's hard to tell because I don't know whether those x-rays were pre-reduction or post-reduction or from the office of the ER, I think it's just important to know that there's a lot you can accept and, frequent, and most of the time you don't need to pin extra articular thumb fractures. Understood. Uh, my next patient is- Hey, Rob, team. can you uh, can you critique your pin placement and that supracondylar fracture? Uh, yeah, I mean, so I think our pins could you could have a, maybe a little bit more spread. Um, uh, you know, our, I think you'd have a little bit more spread in our pin placement. I mean, that would be the main thing I would critique in that supercondylar. This is a, you said this is a two-year-old? Two-year-old. Yeah. There was yeah. not a lot of windows. There's not a lot of room. And if you wind up making multiple holes, then, you know, how much spread do you want to have usually? Usually you want to have, you know, you try to get 30% uh, across the each of, uh, between the spreads. So you want to have like 30% on each column. Yeah, about you know one third of the fracture site. Yep. You know, the closer they get together, the more they felt function like one pin. But two years old, probably fine. Yeah, it was stable on example. Fourteen millimeters is the number. Yeah, and type type two fractures, you have a lot more periosteum intact. It's not as important. As yeah, and I, I teach all the residents to kind of slowly extend the elbow and take a couple sequential X-rays in extension, and that'll tell you whether or not you have stable fixation. Uh, I do that in type twos, type threes, um, no matter what. Uh, next patient is a 14 year old male, status post a scaphoid fracture that uh, appeared to the office about three months following uh, his injury. Um, he was found to have this kind of right scaphoid non union. Um, he, a CT scan was obtained from the office showing some flexion of the tubercle and a little bit of defor and displacement. So he was taken for- What's a, the term they use for that? A humpback deformity. So he was taken for a right scaphoid open reduction in internal fixation with uh, distal radius uh, autologous bone grafting. Is three months technically a non-union? No, it's technically not a non-union. It's, I guess it would be a malunion. Um, non-union for scaphoids, usually, the literature usually talks about being more closer to six months. It is technically a non-union for a scaphoid because there's no way it's gonna heal you know, after three months. It's, 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 it's basically a non-union at that point. I mean, I know 
what the exact definitions are, but that's just never going to heal. That's actually not not really true. We we don't tolerate the healing. Don't want yeah. to be in a cast. What radiographic <laughs> findings would tell you that this will or won't heal with a mobilization? So if you started to see some lytic changes there, you would be a little bit more concerned um, for, you know, uh, this not, in my opinion, not healing. Um, that would be one of the radiographic findings. But the main, the main finding is sclerosis, which you don't have. Everyone gets some cystification as a normal process, but the main finding is sclerosis. So if you don't have sclerosis, particularly in this fracture pattern, and the location of it in this age group, if you immobilized it, it might heal, but nobody's gonna to tolerate three months of time. And so, because it's delayed, and some literature says if it's delayed three weeks or longer, uh, they suggest that the length of time to immobilize it would be exorbitant, and so people will fix this. And I mean, also in this case, he has a compact deformity. Yes. You could also call it an impending non-union. It's, it's, yep. it's delayed. The average well, it's delayed time union. Is delayed right, union is the right term. For it. I, I, I mean, on the T2 scan, you should see some signs of healing if it was going to heal, which we, we don't really see on the CT scan. But also, there was a humpback deformity, and that's the reason I, I personally got the CT scan, because I didn't think it looked too bad on x-ray. I was seeing if it was in okay enough alignment to either talk to the family about just extended casting versus putting a perk screw in. Um, and unfortunately, it showed that there was a humpback deformity. So, so how did you fix the humpback deformity? So we put uh, two K wires in and got better alignment. And then we got a, uh, you know, cortical piece of bone, which we then wedged in um, kind of more like a Fisk technique to um, kind of prevent collapse, correct the deformity. Where did you get the bone from? Uh, the distal radius, fuller portion of the distal radius. Looks good. Next patient is a 13 year old male who fell off of a dirt bike. He presented with a left Salter Harris II femoral neck fracture, initially presented to an outside hospital and was transferred here. Uh, he was then taken, he was neurovascularly intact. He was then taken emergently. Um, for a left hip open reduction internal fixation. Initially, we did a closed reduction and did percutaneous screws. Um, we used uh, an ICP monitor to check for blood flow at the femoral head. There was no blood flow uh, after an anatomic reduction. So we then allowed for some displacement, hoping that would take pressure off of the posterior retinacular vessels. Um, at that point, we still did not have any blood flow on an ICP monitor. So we went, did a modified done approach to the, um, the hip. I did a surgical hip dislocation um, and it appeared that all the posterior retinacular vessels had been sheared off and there was no punctate bleeding on the head. Um, so we ended up fixing it into a little bit of valgus, um, uh, just kind of prophylactically to prepare for possible ABN. Um, would the- or absolute ABN. With the screw placement, since you're crossing the physis, and that's, I'm assuming, another consideration, yep. would, you, would you try to spread out more like in an adult hip fracture? So I, I think ideally, yes, you might want a little bit more spread. I think, you know, we had already had the screws in, so we didn't try to change the trajectory. Um, so I think, you know, initially when we weren't in valgus, they were actually in a pretty good position. When we kind of reach, move, when we shifted the head into a more valgus position, I think, you know, it doesn't look like they're quite as good as they were before. However, I do think that if you're going to get AVN, you're probably going to get it on the kind of more superior aspect, superior and posterior aspect there. So, you know, the screws are more inferior to the neck, the less risk to cut out um, into that area. So are you saying awesome. you had the screws in and then you were able to displace the fracture into a different position? Yeah, we would back no. the screws up so we could adjust the. Oh, okay, you backed. Them. Okay, so you backed them up. You weren't yep. the fracture Perfect. wasn't moving with your screws in there. No. no, we let them. We let them fix when we couldn't get him uh, percutaneously and we couldn't get any blood flow in the ICC monitor. We left the screws in, stapled them closed, repositioned him in a lateral to acute position, and then dislocated the hip within about an hour. And um, 
we played with everything, but the vessels were sheared off the back. So we wanted to try to avoid the zone that's going to collapse by putting them in a little valve that perhaps the area that's perfused by the inferior vessels might retain some head shape. Unfortunately, this is poor. Um, so this was my choice to put screws on. We already had them in the stable portion of the trope. Um, so, you know, we didn't redirect them. We just put the head where we wanted it to. And we also, the most important thing we did, Rob, to help this yeah. kid was cure at the physis so that um, he gets a, a union there. Uh, and if he's going to revascularize, you know, he doesn't have a physial barrier that he has to spend months and months perfusing through. It could potentially happen a little faster. Um, you know, this uh, is a bad prognosis. And unfortunately, this kid is my cousin, um, you know, out of sheer radical coincidence. Um, so, you know, I would do the same thing for anybody, but um, I'm concerned about, you know, what's going to happen with him here. And they're, they're well apprised. Uh, his mother is my second cousin, and uh, I apprise them of everything that lies ahead. What they is ICP monitoring something you is is that just is it helpful? Is it something standard you guys do? Yes, no, it's standard now. So anytime we have an unstable skippy, you know, and I treat a femoral neck fracture the same way in my mind, sir. I, I think I think you cut out, Rob. Yeah, I didn't cut out. Rob, what's an ICP up monitor? An ICP monitor is an intracerebral pressure device. It measures pressures in the brain during brain bleeds. It's called, we also call it a bolt. So you, and you, what is you just, you're plugging that into the femoral head. What are, you, what are you doing? So you thread it, you thread it through the cannulated screws. So the screws are cannulated. The monitor is a very thin tube. Just stick it up there so you can see it kind of at the, you would see it usually at the. How, how reliable is that? Very. So I, I looked up some literature on it. In Skiffy, it's pretty reliable. You get like a waveform um, in Skiffy, uh, but for femoral neck fractures, the, it, what I've seen in the literature is it hasn't shown to be um, as correlated as it was in the Skiffy population. So what percentage of these types of fractures go on if you don't dick around with them and do surgical dislocations? Yep. What percentage go on to having bad so osteonecrosis? This, this is a, a there's a Delbet classification, and this is a, a would classify as a type two a trans cervical. AVN rates about twenty eight percent. Whether or not you do a surgical hip dislocation, um, the one paper I looked at that did some surgical hip dislocations, they had an AVN rate of twenty six percent. So it's very similar. Um, I think our main idea when we were initially doing a surgical hip dislocation was we had a thought about doing a shortening osteotomy of the femoral neck to try to continue to, to re relieve more tension if there was tension on those posterior retinacular vessels. But as soon as we opened it up and we saw that they were sheared off, we decided against doing that um, because that would change you know, his long-term anatomy a little bit more drastically. Probably would, the, have... would the osteotomy of the femoral neck, how is that done? Is that done through the fracture? I, or... I, no, through the tap steel neck. You go yeah. through the neck and shorten it to take tension off the vessel. So it's designed for unstable slips, but we applied the same principles here because the idea is that if, you, if the vessels are kinked or you have a way to take tension off them and restore them, you know, you have control over this. This is the standard of care in Pete's world now uh, to progress through his hierarchy, which you need to be in a place where someone has experience doing a modified done surgical hip dislocation. But as Rob said, the AVN rates are similar. Unfortunately, for the Del Bay, I, I would classify this as a one rod because it really did go up to the fikes as, as a salt or yeah. two. Um, you know, I think the AVN rate is significantly higher. The old literature would say, you know, 80 to 100 percent, but I think it's more realistic to 50 percent. It all depends on the status of the vessels. And in this case, they were sheared off. The periosteum was ripped entirely off the neck. But we were able to get the best possible positioning, you know, in my mind for uh, avoiding AVN or collapse onto those screws before he heals because that can happen where you have the head softens and you put those screws you know, in the ideal position all the way up, then, uh, you know, you can collapse on the screws and now you got an particular screw and you're dealing with taking the hardware out before you want to. Um, and then the other component here was curating out the physis, which was more in that, uh, you know, cephalad portion of the head uh, because there was a thurston holland fragment on the uh, inferior medial portion of the head. So that was the rationale here. Yep. All right, we'll move on. Uh, next patient's a 15-year-old male, status post a seizure. He 
uh, present with this left proximal humerus uh, humeral head fracture dislocation. This uh, was transferred to us from another outside institution. Um, he was dis dislocated on his transfer. He was unable to be relocated in the outside institution. Um, it was out for about a week and a half, apparently, um, before fixation. Uh, he had been uh, not taking any seizure medications. And so once he was appropriately um, stabilized from a seizure standpoint, we took him for a left proximal humerus open reduction internal fixation. Next patient is a 67-year-old female. So that's what's fall down the stairs. She presented with a left elbow fracture dislocation, as well as a right distal radius fracture, and also has a left first metatarsal fracture. Here's her wrist. A CT scan was obtained of the elbow, showing a proximal ulna fracture, as well as kind of a radial neck fracture. Her great toe. She was taken the following day for a right distal radius open reduction internal fixation, as well as a left ulna open reduction and internal fixation. And we closed reduced the radial neck um, during surgery and we uh, decided not to fix it at this time. Was it stable? Yeah. Uh, it, it was relatively stable. It was, uh, I mean, the elbow was stable. Um, she had good range of motion. Um, so we, we just decided to see if, uh, you know, it would heal and rather we didn't have we, we would have considered doing our arthroplasty but we didn't have any of the arthroplasty equipment available at the time we did this so i think so, this was wait, the, so your plan was always to leave it alone since you don't have the equipment our plan going in i think was to potentially fix it and then versus replace it when we saw the the radial head we realized it was I think the decision was made by the attending to attempt uh, non-operative treatment. We didn't have the replacement um, devices at, at the hospital. Um, and so, so isn't that a, maybe a contraindication to doing a surgery if you don't have the equipment to do the surgery? No. So we're yeah, just saying that the, the, relative. The, so the decision to leave it as is was pro probably primarily guided by the fact that you don't have the equipment to do the procedure, even if you needed to. Correct. I love watching Rob Flounder. <laughs> is, is the, did you strip the uh, radial? Did you strip that, or was that pretty much uh, intact when you uh, when you looked at it? Was the alignment well, uh, the radial the radial neck or in head or the ulna? The radial neck, was that? The, the alignment is, when we looked at it, we, we used a freer and kind of pushed it back into place. Um, but it was pretty, it was pretty close. I mean, it was a little bit angulated, um, but once we put the freer in, you know, it was in line with the capitellum on almost every view. So we decided to leave it as it was. So you didn't strip the head from all the, you didn't strip the head from all the soft tissue? No, no, we, we barely, we approached it through the, fra the fractured ulna fragment with a freer, we really didn't strip the head of any soft tissue. Well, the reduction of the ulna looks excellent. I'm not sure why the plate's so proud proximally, but the reduction looks excellent and the wrist looks excellent and that's probably gonna be okay. And unfortunately, the only other choice you could have had, because I don't know that you would have been able to fix that radial head is to replace it. And that's basically what that piece is acting as is a radial head replacement. So I don't think that's terrible. Yeah, so my my plan was to never touch the radius uh, at all based on what it looked like preoperatively. I didn't I didn't intend to replace it. And if I had to, I would have tried to fix it, although those can be really problematic. And, uh, you know, that plate, David, that plate sits off. I mean, that's squished onto the, uh, the um, triceps tendon. There's there's no way to get that plate any closer, you know, for that proximal area of it. It's it's that's just the way it sits. One of the one of the questions in the radius. Why doesn't that radial styloid screw capture the radial styloid better? Why isn't it moving more into the styloid instead of dorsally? That's an excellent question. We struggle to get that styloid where it needs to be. It's a higher energy injury than just, you know, somebody falling. She went downstairs and, um, you know, that was pretty well smashed. It was, it was hard to do that. We had to put a joystick in and, 
try and wedge that into the right place. It's not great fixation of the radial styloid. Agreed. Can't you, aren't those screws variable angle? Can't you variably angle it 15 or 20 degrees? You can, absolutely. And, and then I don't think we did that for that radial styloid screw, but once we got, because we struggled with it, once we got it there, I was like, I was, I was tempted to replace them. We had already replaced one screw because it was a little too long dorsally. And I just thought well enough alone because it was stable at that point. Well, I would splint that for at least a month because I think that's not great fixation of the styloid, even though it's perfect now. And for the, for the residents, one of the things in the timeout, when you do that timeout before starting the case is, do you have all the equipment in the room? Just, just make sure you have all the implants you want to have, just in case. Can you go back to that uh, humerus, that proximal humerus? Was that humerus healed already when you had to repair it? When we, when we opened it, uh, the proximal humerus in the pediatric patient, so there was an abundant callus formation. We did have to break up a decent amount of callus. Um, you can see, oh, let me go back to the CAT scan here. You can see that the, uh, you know, the lesser is off here. The head is posteriorly displaced. So it took a while to get the head out from the, from, you know, to get it back into the glenohumeral joint. Um, the lesser was almost completely encased in callus there, but we were able to get the head back into the glenohumeral joint. We had to rotate the head um, by putting a K wire in it to get fixation. And we kind of also had to do a uh, greater tuberosity kind of osteotomy in order to kind of be able to get back there. But so there was it, there was an abundant amount of callus already there. Is there any blood supply to the head? I, I don't think so. What is the main blood supply to the head? Blood supply is the posterior circumflex humeral vessels. Me, the, the medial vessels posteriorly, right? Yeah. Okay, so you strip the lesser. I, I mean, you had to obviously you had to reduce it. And yep. what and what supplies the greater tuberosity? Uh, I believe it's the, ace. The eight anterior circumflex laterally. Yeah. Okay. So what's is there? What's the concern long term for this? What do you tell the family? The, the long term concern for this patient would be, you know, AVN of the humeral head. I mean, obviously he's probably going to have a fight seal rest, but he's almost skeletally mature, so that's not really our big concern. So the main concern is AVN of the humeral head, which which can do well. It looks like you have good fixation there, but that's that's you may not be done with that. No, I don't. So this, this was treated two weeks out because of a delay in diagnosis or so because he was he treated was two weeks out from uh, there was a delay in diagnosis. And then there was also a delay in transfer and a delay in him being um, stable, stable from a seizure standpoint. Got it. Like we, we, he had had recurrent seizures at the outside hospital. He came here and then he became stabilized on seizure medications. And once we realized that he was stable, I mean, there, it, it had been out already for a week. So there, the thought was there wasn't a, a, a huge rush to just get him into the OR. Better get him stable first on a seizure yeah. medications and then fix him. And what, what incision did you use? We used a delta pack. The last case is a 33-year-old male who fell off an ATV. He presented with a left displaced femoral neck fracture. Uh, he was neurovascularly intact. He was taken for a left femoral neck open reduction internal fixation. Um, we did a uh, Smith-Pete approach and uh, open reduced the femoral neck. Does that fracture go down to include the lesser there or is that just, what am I saying? No, that I, just, I think that's just oh. projectional. Thank you. Morning. This patient is a 21 year old male who is a uh, division one athlete uh, pitcher um, who sustained an injury where somebody stepped on his foot um, during agility drills. And then a week later he was uh, running and he uh, felt a pop in his foot and was unable to ambulate. Found to have this zone two fifth metatarsal base fracture. Uh, he was taken for uh, his uh, fifth metatarsal base, uh, close reduction and uh, percutaneous fixation. Do you think that that was broken when somebody stepped on his foot or do you think that that was not related? 
Uh, it's hard to say. Um, in zone two, sometimes it can be a, you know, a, a stress fracture in zone two. Um, so this could have been a preceding event. Um, it could have actually fractured during that event. Um, and he, you know, noticed it when he, you know, twisted and fell running a week later. Uh, it's hard to say. It could have been either one. So, so Dr. Kirschenbaum was talking earlier about sclerosis, about a fracture site. Is there any here? Uh, there is none there, no. Okay. Is there, oh, what, what size screw is that? It's a 4-0 um, screw, not cannulated. Uh, he's, a, he's a big guy. Uh, there's is, studies showing as high as like a 6-5 screw. I think that's pretty big. But I think, you know, the, isn't there, I think the issue is kind of the bite and the size the relative to the canal. I think that's why it looks so small compared to a big guy. Yeah. How was the bite on this? It was fine. I mean, there was purchase. I'll tell you here, it looks like the fracture edges are very, very smooth. Yeah, I think there's some peaking there too. Yeah, this was actually uh, done about two weeks after that initial x-ray. So that could be why. Well, you don't get smooth edges in two weeks. This might be longer. This is, smells like a stress fracture. Yeah. When is he going back to play sports? Keep him um, in, a, in a boot or a splint for like two or three weeks. Let him start to gradually weight bear um, at about know six to eight weeks we can you know reassess for the union um probably let him let him play at about eight to twelve weeks but uh, we'll definitely leave the screw in until he's done if it were to bother him um we would still keep it in during his playing career Morning. <clears throat> First patient is an 83 year old male who sustained a triple fall with this uh, left intertrochanteric hip fracture in the setting of severe end stage osteoarthritis. Uh, we did discuss different uh, operative treatments for this. Decided to go with a left total hip arthroplasty with a tough seal uh, fit stem. Uh, next is a uh, 93 year old male, standard trip and fall with a right from a neck fracture. A little harder to appreciate in the x rays we did of CAT scans. So I only have one cut here. Uh, and he was taken for a right cemented ME arthroplasty. You know, that prior oh, patient, that, that, was, that arthritis was, um, was there something else going on there? Um, I mean, the hip center is up a little bit. He's got a big cyst. He did not have any history of anything else going on, you know, history of cancer, anything like that. Um, we ended up using a quite a large cup to fill the defect. And sure, but with that level of degenerative change, I mean, there was no history of an infection. There was no history no. of tumor, nothing like that. Nothing like that. Thank you. Was, the, was the femoral neck fracture displaced or non-displaced? Uh, it wasn't very displaced in the x-rays, but once we uh, actually opened up the hip capsule, it was fairly, fairly displaced, more than appreciated on the, on the x-rays. He also had a history of a femoral neck fracture on the contralateral side uh, that went on to AVN and uh, collapsed and ended up needing this revision to a total hip arthroplasty on the contralateral side. So there's concern that he had very poor bone quality, which is why we ended up which is what we found on the right side. So we did cement that side. Good morning. Uh, the first patient is 64 year old male uh, with mild develop developmental delay, living in the group home, taking care of other uh, people with uh, 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 medical conditions. She was deaf, mute. She was allowed for a one hour a walk 
a day and he went for a walk and got hit by the car. Uh, he came to the hospital as a trauma with uh, multiple fractures, including left LC to pelvis fracture, left ankle fracture dislocation, left lisp fracture, uh, left proximal humerus fracture, uh, multiligamentous knee injury with left tibial spine fracture, uh, excessive laceration of the posterior knee, and some fracture, uh, some TP fractures in the lumbar spine. Patients was medically optimi optimized and taken to the OR. Andres, why, why do you say he was a, the LC new pelvis? Why? Uh, so uh, that's the uh, anterior ring fracture and the crescent uh, of the ilium. Sure, but that doesn't have to be. You're cutting out a lot, Tim. Cannot hear you, Dr. Lady. So the decision was made to take these patients to the operating room for pelvis open reduction and internal fixation. At the same time, we IND the laceration of the posterior knee and close it. And at the same time, we put the X fix on the uh, left ankle. Uh, the proximal humerus, we decide to treat in a sling. And uh, for his spine problems, uh, we decide to, we recommend that TLSO brace when he's out uh, of the bed. Uh, so the patients uh, on day two uh, was downgraded to the floor. And unfortunately, he was fed and he aspirated, and he went into the cardiac arrest. He was resuscitated. Now this patient is in critical condition, intubated in the CQ. We're planning to fix the, the ankle in the future, but now uh, the trauma team is discussing the goal of cares for these patients. We don't know what will happen soon. How did you decide on the order to fix it? Why did you do the pelvis instead of the ankle? Uh, so the patient was, when he came to the hospital, he was hemodynamically unstable. Okay. So we were thinking that the uh, pelvis may be a reason of his bleeding. So we wanted to fix the pelvis first. And uh, because there was excessive surgery, the patient was in CQ. Uh, we decided to do less on the ankle. We decided to stabilize the ankle. And we take care of the of the laceration of the knee because it was open wound. So everything, so the bleeding was from the pelvis. I think so because after surgery, patient stabilized and he okay. did very well. And next day he was downgraded from CQ to floor, and he was doing well on the floor until this event when he aspirated. Uh, next patient is 42-year-old male, status uh, post-motorcycle uh, crash, who came to the hospital uh, with the pelvic injury, APC2 fracture, uh, elbow, left elbow injury with acute on chronic coronoid fracture. The elbow was stable, uh, but tender. So we proceed with the CAT scan to appreciate the, uh, better the, the fracture pattern. We find, find out minimal coronoid fracture. Uh, with some chronic changes as well. Uh, the patients also had uh, left elbow instability. Uh, there was no fracture, it, oh, sorry, uh, left wrist instability. There was no fracture, so we proceed with MRI and we find out excessive ligamentous and capsular uh, uh, injury. The patient is scheduled for the, elbow, uh, for the wrist stabilization today. And before that, we uh, decided to take the patients to the OR for fixation of the pelvis, we put two screws, uh, stabilizing both SI joints, and uh, we close symphysis and fix it with the uh, plate. Can you go back to the x-rays of the wrist? Yeah, so the, 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 oh. the wrist is shifted to pulmonary. Right, uh, so, so if, you, if you didn't get a chance to read the latest article in Journal of Hand Surgery, we, we wrote this up. This is on the translation of the wrist which does not require an MRI. 
And if more than 50% of the lunate is not articulating with the radius, that's pathognomonic for ulnar translation. Plus this patient has the, the volar flex sign. So if you look at your middle image, there's a little dot. If you blow it up, that's part of the volar ligaments. And recognizing this, although it seems so simple that you recognize it is not so simple. So the fact that you recognize this because the majority of these get unrecognized is a very good thing because if you don't fix this right away, the results are horrible. So what, what's the treatment for this? So we're planning to do ligamentous repair and fix the elbow, uh, wrist, sorry, with the K wires. So when you say ligament repair, what ligaments are you repairing? And uh, the patient has both volar and dorsal ligaments. Uh, right. I think we'll, we'll fix both. Well, it's not both, it's a, it's a huge amount of work. What ligament is critical for someone to have only translation? What has to be torn? I think it's a volar ligament. Which one? Uh, uh, so you have, to, you have to tear the ulnar carpal ligament. If you don't tear those, if you, if you transect all the different ligaments, you won't get this. You have to, you have to transect that ulnar volar carpal ligament. So you might make your life a lot easier because all of the different procedures have the same re results. You might make your life easier by pinning the radial lunate joint and just holding it for six to eight weeks without going in because whether you fix the ligaments or not, the results are the same. So you can go in there, you'll, you know, everything's disrupted. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's like tearing your ACL. Uh, you can fix the ACL, they don't do well. So you can hope that it scars in by immobilizing it for six to eight weeks and pinning and making sure the lunate is perfectly aligned in the lunate facet. Thank you. Uh, next patient is 86 year old female status post fall uh, with right hip basis cervical neck fracture. The patient is taken to the OR for right hip intramedial nailing. Uh, the next patient is a 60 year old female with history of AML who was involved in a uh, car accident, low energy injury. Uh, she went to the outside hospital, was diagnosed with bilateral SC1 insufficiency fracture. And um, because the patient was uh, thrombocytopenic, she was transferred to uh, him service in our hospital and we were asking for a consult. The patient was taken to the uh, OR for examination under anesthesia. We find out that the pelvis ring is unstable and we'll stabilize these patients with the uh, uh, screw for the posterior column, stabilizing both SI joints and the screw in the anterior column on the right side. Uh, next patient is a 68 year old female involved with MDC. We came to the hospital with a right LC2 uh, pelvis fracture still see to variant with the uh, incomplete fusion of the right side joint. The patient was taken to the OR uh, for bilateral uh, SI joint fixations with the percutaneous screws. Thank you. That's it, thank you.